All right, today I've got a super, super exciting video for you. All right, this is big. All right, could Bitcoin hit $1 million in 90 days? Let that sink in. Yep. Could Bitcoin hit $1 million in 90 days? So that's the subject of this video. And before you turn off the video, I, I'm going to really show you, like, you know, proof, like, you know, about why this is a potential outcome. But before I get there, talk about a disclaimer. This video, you know, my tweets, my Substack, which I'm going to, you know, show you the website for, not investment advice. Past performance is not equal to future results, and there are no guarantees, there are no certainties. Errors, mistakes, oversight. Hey, I'm a human being. Our team are a human. We make mistakes. There's errors. There's no guarantee that you know all the things that we cite and use are perfect. Things can go wrong. Capital loss is a likely outcome. In trading, speculating, investment, there's risk, which means you can lose money. And you have to consider that before you do anything. Uh, finally, uh, I, the owners, contractors, employees of ATG Digital Media, which is my company, we own, trade, transact in the investments that are mentioned in these videos. All right. With the disclaimer out of the way, let's get to the heart of this video, which is that there is a investor entrepreneur dude on Twitter. His handle is at Balaji S. You can go look him up on Twitter. And his name is Balaji Srinivasan. And he is making a bet. And there is a bet that he's actually taken on with, I believe, two people. I know for sure that one person has taken him up on this bet that Bitcoin will be at $1 million in 90 days. Wait, are you serious? Yeah, he's making that bet. And you can go and look at the construction of that bet on Twitter by following him. But I you know, wrote a substack about this and you can check into some of the details in there as well at paulmampilly.substack.com and um, you'll see the headline that I used for that Substack. So who is this Balaji S? And why should you maybe take him and his prediction of Bitcoin being $1 million in 90 days seriously? Because this dude is a serious dude, all right? I mean, okay, so I looked him up and you can see as well, we're gonna just click. I'll show you a screenshot if you Google him. I mean, he's the ex-CFO of Coinbase. He is a ex-partner of Andreessen Horowitz, which, if you are unaware, is one of the world's leading venture capital firms. He is the ex-founder of a startup called Council, which is involved in DNA screening. If you want to follow me uh, on Twitter uh, to get follow-ups on all of this, uh, that's my Twitter, at Mampili Guru. But let's get to some of the meat, like, you know, what's going on. So now I cited, you know, everything that Balaji S is, I mean, the Coinbase and Resmartless. But the real reason to take Balaji seriously is this tweet from January 30th of 2020. January 30th of 2020, where he not just anticipates COVID, but he anticipates so many of the after effects and aftershocks of it. And that tweet is truthfully, you just look at that tweet and you go, wow, 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 wow. Okay, and you can see it yourself. When you put that tweet up, you can see it. So I then went back and just sort of like using my financial understanding of the world, looking at everything that is going on, um, I try to like break down like, okay, why, how could Bitcoin hit 1 million in 
90 days. And, you know, obviously he's given us the price, which is 1 million. He's given us the time frame, which is 90 days. And it's going to be some function of like this, like some event, some crises, some, some mixture of the two. So I rack my brain and be like, okay, like, well, what's, what is going on out there? Well, you know, well, so if you go and do research on this, it's like, well, you know, the dollar is going to lose its reserve status. Reserve status means that central banks around the world, they buy dollars and they keep it sort of like in their vaults and then they issue their currency based on the number of dollars that they have. So that's called reserve status. And, you know, this has been rumored for a very long time. In fact, there have been a number of headlines showing that uh, U.S. dollar is losing market share at, I think, at its peak, which was in the 1970s. It had 80% market share in terms of reserve currency status. Today, it's at something near 60. But so this is talked about a great deal. And uh, I mean, while it would come as a shock, I think that like some number of people are prepared. And we know that central banks around the world have been buying gold. So yeah, I mean, this is would definitely be uh, an event, a crisis, but you know, it's it's been talked about for a long time. Other people talk about, you know, devaluation. Uh, against other fiat currencies like the euro or the yen. But the thing is, like, I mean, if you go and look at the state of Japan or Europe or any of these countries, or you think about alternatives to the dollar, whether it be the Chinese yuan or any anything else, most people end up is like, well, dollar is still the best of all of those currencies. So this too has been like thought about. Now, I went and dug into something that, you know, I've been writing about on my Substack, which is this, this bank run crisis. Some people think there's no crisis. Some people think it's over. But I personally believe that is really just getting going. So one of the things that can happen is the failure of a major kind of unknown institution. Like how many people had heard or really knew about Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac in 2007, 2008? I can tell you very, very few people. So I did some digging. and. You know, there is this fairly unknown uh, government-sponsored enterprise, which is similar to Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. It's called the Federal Home Loan Banks. And uh, it is a lender to all of the most stressed banks in this current bank-run crisis that is unfolding, unfolding. And so when you dig into this Federal Home Loan Bank, uh, it was, you know, created by federal legislation to provide essentially money to all of these small banks and credit unions and even insurance companies. And um, we'll just put up, you know, um, the description from their website. But what's truly shocking is that, you know, I sort of began to focus on them because when I saw that they had lent Silvergate Bank, which shut themselves down, $4.3 billion dollars. Uh, and that was done, you know, um, I think it was like a couple of months ago. And that's like just that number caught my attention. But then you go look at their website. They got assets of $946 billion. They just have capital of $55 billion. I mean, this is a very levered up organization. And they say that, like, you know, they have no connection per se to the federal government. But listen, folks, I mean, you know, th this this organization, bank you know, you have to be a, a, a bank or a credit union or insurance company to belong to it. And they are like the banker to regional banks. So if something happened here, well, who is going to come and give them the money? I mean, it is going to be, of course, the federal government. And it would mean, you know, hundreds of billions of dollars that would have to get put in here um, in, in a worst case scenario. Now, do I know exactly what, you know, the scenario is going to be? Do I know that Federal Home Loan Bank is going to be the trigger? No, I don't. Uh, but nonetheless, this leverage, I mean, <laughs> that's for real, right? $947 billion supported by $55 billion in capital. Mm, yeah, you know, that's pretty highly leveraged. All right. So I'll put myself on a limb and say, you know, I think that's going to be part of this. if. Balaji's prediction is going to come true, which is that something is going to unfold that is going to cause people to question whether some of these small banks, credit unions, et cetera, you know, have a banker of last resort. Because remember, all banks are, you know, they practice what's called fractional banking. They take your money and they lend out, you know, multiples of it, five, six, seven, eight dollars more. So if everybody wants their money back all at the same time, well, they just don't have it. 
So they got to go to the federal home loan bank and get it from them. And if they don't have it, hmm, well, then the federal government has to give it to them. So either way, uh, you know, I'm not the only one saying that the bank run crisis is not yet over. Jamie Dimon, who I assume has like more information than I do, uh, he says the same thing. And he says its after effects are going to be significant. So, hey, um, but let's get back to the point here, which is that what are the other potential catalysts for Bitcoin to get to $1 million? Well, I wrote about this in my Substack on Monday saying that Fed now is a program that is going to modernize the understructure of the Fed, where, you know, right now, you know, if you want to move money and between banks, you got to go through the Federal Reserve and it takes, I don't know, one day, two days, three days, you know, they've got the wire system, they've got all these things, and they're going to make it where you can move money 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. And I have said in my Substack, well, I mean, that's just going to make it easier to move money from all these small banks to money market funds or to bigger banks. And it has the potential to actually like really exacerbate this bank run crisis. In other words, you know, it makes money even easier to move. Um, so that's one potential. And that is supposed to be introduced in July of this year. The other one that, you know, kind of has fallen off the radar that no one talks about is this debt ceiling crisis. Right. I mean, you know, so the U.S. government hit its debt ceiling technically in January and we have been operating under special rules, et cetera. And I read a Moody's analysis that actually sets a date, August 18th. I just put down August here because let's say, you know, the date could be moved by a day or two. But it says like, hey, Moody says that like you can actually see this in the bond trading of Treasury bonds where everything after August 18th, you know, People want a higher yield, which in other words, people are really setting that up as a date. So that's one potential catalyst. And the third one is that, you know, uh, if OPEC were to accept Bitcoin as payment for oil, well, this would definitely be something that's an eye opener. Many of you might have seen that just yesterday, Saudi Arabia uh, decided to cut oil production, which was a shock and a surprise because Generally, it's expected that they will sort of like play along with what they choose to do with oil. And that was a bit of a shock to the system. So bottom line here, what do I think? What do I think? Well, I'm not going to put myself out on a limb like Balaji uh, S and say that, you know, Bitcoin's going to be at $1 million in 90 days. But when I just go through all of the evidence, I have to say, it's got better than 50 50 odds, you know, of it getting to a million or something near that in the next 12 to 24 months, because all of the scenarios that I laid out are real. It's backed by evidence, backed by facts, backed by actual things that are happening, not going to happen. You know, bank run crisis is happening. I mean, Saudi Arabia just cut oil production in a complete surprise. Normally they cooperate with the US government. So, into a slowdown, you know, they, you know, they, they wouldn't do that. You know, which, you know, which would have the effect of lifting uh, oil prices. So there are so many things that are going on. So, hey, if you buy into this, then it happens in 90 days. Well, hey, I mean, you know, you've got, you got, you, you know, you made big money very, very quickly. All right. If you like analysis like this, ideas like this, a focus on crypto, growth stocks, technology, innovation, I call it OGI, opportunity growth and innovation, which sort of like really today is growth stocks, tech stocks, and crypto. Well, check into subscriptions at my company, atgdigital.media is our website. Subscriptions begin at $9.99. Subscribe to my Substack at the website be before. Follow me on Twitter or, hey, be nice. Give us a thumbs up, subscribe to the channel, and come back next week. This is Paul saying bye.